Everyday life can feel like running whitewater rapids. It's loud, it's chaotic. All of that noise and movement takes all of our attention and makes it really hard to focus. Once you exit the rapid into a pool, everything becomes calm. The contrast between the noise and the quiet heightens all of your senses and allows you to tap into everything around you. The light through the trees, the birds, you can absorb your surroundings. Fishing provides a similar prolonged sense of clarity. It allows you to be present. And once you've experienced this feeling, it's addicting. Being present is why I fell in love with fly fishing. We built our living and lifestyle as fishing guides so we could live every day as present as possible. Before the guide life, I was serving food and cocktails at the Rainforest Resort on the Olympic Peninsula. I was in my 20s and that's when I fell in love with fishing. I decided that's what I wanted to do with my life. With the confidence of the young and naive, six months before I met my future husband, Justin, he and I applied for the same job in a taco shop. Guess who got the gig? He comes from a long line of Pacific Northwest fishermen and has dedicated his life to fishing. I call up the, the fly shop and I'm like, hey, like, what's going on? And the assistant manager goes, well, we, uh, there's this girl that, that started working here and she has the, the job now. And, and, and we're just not gonna need you anymore. I was like, okay, okay. There's no way that, that, that this person, like I don't care who it is, but like they, I, there's no way this one's like more qualified than me. And she's just a better worker. Despite the competitive start, we became close friends and started fishing together and hanging out. While society is pushing you to check all these boxes, stable job, check, health insurance, check. We were trying to check off fish species. And our motto was the Robert Earl Keane song, the road goes on forever and the party never ends. they say is history. Now he's not just my husband, he's the fishiest guy I know. Grab that was good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 34 and a half by 21. As a couple, we fully immersed ourselves in the fish bum lifestyle. We made being on the water our number one priority and our means of employment. We were in pursuit of the endless season by splitting our year in Alaska and Oregon in a never ending quest for our favorite game fish. While most people our age were having babies, we also expanded our family. Getting a dog was the best thing that happened to us. And Kata became more than just a family member. She's part of the guide team. She's like, oh, that feels good. That's exactly what I did in the bear poop. Nasty. So stinky, Kata. Oh, right under her chin. Still stinks, but at least it's got straight poop on her. This guide season in Alaska was really important to us because we welcomed a new addition to the guide crew. Nuka means little sister in Inuit. Needless to say, raising a puppy in late season Alaska during the guide season is a challenging prospect. What do you think, Nuka? She awake? She's right there. Nukes! Letting it rip on the old hat. Oh, Nuka, don't you take that into your den. Go get the puppy. Before she gets eaten by a fox, get the puppy. 
For Pacific Northwesterners, going to Alaska is like going back in time. These really wild and healthy ecosystems, which once dominated the landscape in the Pacific Northwest, still very much exist in Alaska. Bristol Bay is so wild and uninhibited. There's still super healthy runs of salmon returning every year, feeding the entire ecosystem, especially our favorite fish. Genetically, rainbow trout and steelhead are the same species. And while dogs are technically all the same species, look at how different they are from one breed to the next. But every now and then you find rainbows ranging in similar size, look, and behavior as a steelhead. There's just more of them. They're more aggressive, providing many more hookups, which doesn't always equal more fish to the net. That fish is like, I'm just gonna jump up on the bank here and make you my Really, the only thing you can do in that is just freaking put your rod in the water. And when you don't have anywhere to put it, you can't do anything. Yeah, right. Oh, just came on the button. Damn. Not to like tell you what to do. Yeah. Once you get them, just like try to keep that low downstream side pressure. Oh! Wow. I don't really mind when people lose fish, but I yeah. just do mind when you lose fish. It just hurts my heart. That was a great encounter. <laughs> that was a great encounter. I should have just stabbed her. Yeah. I got pissed when I would have shot her Yep. So smoked. Yeah. That's the biggest grab I've ever had. The late season rainbows we catch in Alaska are very similar to the steelhead we catch in Oregon. And we fish to them just like we'd fish for steelhead. Barely move. 18 inch girth, 32, 32 and a half, or 32. Doesn't matter. Putting people on steelhead size Alaska rainbows is super rewarding and makes up for all of the fishless days guiding back in Oregon. I'm so glad you let go of all those other ones so that could be your glory fish. It was glorious. That was glorious. He was so... Perfect. Have you ever seen a rainbow trout like that? <laughs> that is so special. That's incredible. Look at my rod. <laughs> Who cares? We don't need it anymore. You're done. Day's over for you, B. You don't get to get more than one of those a day. We cut you off. It's interesting to look back at the life we've created on the water. I guess our path has not been mainstream and we've traded the hustle and bustle and noise and chaos of everyday life for what matters the most to us. Life-changing experiences with guests who become family. It's not about us. We want people to just walk away and be like, that was so incredible, appreciate it super grateful for a wild place like this and getting to be there. That's why we do this. That's the reason why when I go back to Oregon, I want to fight so hard to try to make those fisheries better because they used to be like this. When our Alaska season draws to a close, we migrate south and slide right into a new guide season on the Oregon coast. 
For years, we lived a transient existence out of our camper until we could finally buy our first home. A real home in a quiet coastal community where we felt at peace, free to do our thing and continue to sidestep the hustle and bustle of the fast-paced world. Life seemed perfect. Like, what could go wrong? Walking here, you're walking through a really tall forest, steep hillsides, there's a lot of moss. It's really quiet, it's cool. It feels really wet and damp. It has just a bit of a pristine feel. You can hear the water running. You can see wildlife in there. And then you walk out into this, and it's kind of like walking into the twilight zone or going for like a moonscape or a different planet. So I was really concerned about our water just from the smell coming out of the tap and then the notices that I got with my monthly water bill. But I didn't even really know the extent of uh, our water issues until one day I was walking Kata on the beach and I ran into Nancy Webster walking her dog. And I asked her, you know, where does our water come from? She looked up and pointed at the clear cuts and said, Jetty Creek. That's where your water comes from. When I first came into the watershed and saw the clear cutting all the way to Jenny Creek and the feeder, feeder creeks cut, uh, I was really pissed. Like, who would do this? Who in their right mind would cut down the trees all the way to the creek? And then I really realized that this isn't a loggers issue. Even though it's completely legal by Oregon Forestry Practices Act currently. This is a management issue. The deeper I dove into the issues with our watershed, the scarier it got. Not only were they clear cutting the source watershed for our community's drinking water right into the wetlands, they were aerial spraying after the clear cut. I really value the time that I get to spend uh, in these pristine places and these beautiful watersheds uh, guiding guests. I think it's really hard to come home at the end of the day and look out my window and see massive clear cuts and turn on my tap water and smell like a swimming pool and know that it's not clean and pristine in the watershed just a mile from my house. This felt like a direct assault not only on my family's drinking water, but the health of the ecosystems and the wild places we built our life around. And when I learned similar practices were compromising communities and ecosystems for other watersheds, I could not remain quiet. It's been five years since we started fighting for our watersheds and clean water here in Oregon. All the while, other conservation battles wage in our other home in Bristol Bay, Alaska. These wild places that give us so much, they deserve our attention when they need help. I didn't go looking for conservation issues or ask the responsibility to protect watersheds. The problems found us. In many ways, taking on environmental issues feels like running whitewater rapids. It's tumultuous, it's terrifying, it's opposite of the serenity we've pursued as a family. Perhaps true presence is knowing when to fight the whitewater's chaos in pursuit of calm downstream after the rapid. This is why I love fishermen and stewards of wild places everywhere. We'll never stop fighting for our wild places, whether in our backyards or thousands of miles away. We are the Jedi. <laughs>